Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody that's been waiting to get started, thank you so much for your patience. I appreciate you logging in early and getting things set up and ready to go. Everybody that's just logged in and hearing me for the first time, my name is Justin McBride. I am a program manager here at Drug Free AZ Kid Org. Um, before we, uh, I get into a little bit about who I am, who we are, and what we're going to talk about today, I'm going to just remind you of the survey that's in front of you. On the screen, there's a poll with some questions. If you could take a, a few moments to answer those questions, we'll refer back to those here in a little bit with the webinar. But before we get into that, uh, I want to let you know a little bit about um, me, a little bit about our organization. Well, first, drugfreeazykids.org. Who are we? Well, we are a nonprofit organization who's dedicated to reducing um, and preventing youth drug and alcohol use. And we do that through a number of avenues. We present webinars like the one you're about to see today. We also do workshops uh, at schools that are six weeks long. Um, we do them at schools, churches, different community groups, and they're called active parenting. These workshops take parents through building what they need to instill qualities of character in their kid that will result in them making the types of decisions that we want them to be making. Um, to be thinking before they act. Thing, we talk about things like communication, cooperation, um, as well as strategies to prevent youth drug and alcohol use. Those uh, are active parenting workshops. You can find more about those on our website. Um, you can also find more about our one-time presentations, which range anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half, where we cover what we call the big four, the drugs that are really prevalent um, among youth here in Arizona specifically. We give a lot of the details about what the drugs are, how they're used, and what parents can do to keep their kids safe. And we also send out monthly e-news. And this e-news contains a number of articles on current trends and topics that are relevant to parents in Arizona. And we try to give as much information in a concise amount of uh, words as possible because we know you guys are busy. So most of those blogs are ones that you can read within a minute or two. But just because they're so short doesn't mean they're not packed full of great information because we link you to tons of sources outside of our organization as well that can help you um, get your kids the tools and resources they need to be able to say no to drugs and alcohol. And we also partner with a number of organizations like today. Today we are bringing to you um, Claudia Gilbert from Teen Law School. Um, Claudia founded Teen Law School a number of years ago, and I'm sure she's going to get into a little bit about what Teen Law School does and a little bit about her, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, but they focus on a number of issues pertaining to teens and the law. And today, that's what we're going to talk a little bit about. She's going to bring a different perspective than we um, bring at our typical webinar. She's going to take it more from a, a legal point of view and what that means to our kids and, and the six Ds. So at this time, I'm going to go ahead and introduce you to Claudia. She'll hop on here. You'll see her pop up here in a second once she gets her video and her mic set and ready to go. Um, you'll probably see her popping up right now. There I am. Hey, oh, hey, Claudia. Thanks for joining us. Claudia is actually joining us from a probably a cooler place today. You're um, Where are you at again? I'm in Salem, Oregon, yeah. where it is 60 degrees and cloudy and lovely. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm going to stick around here. So if anybody has questions throughout the webinar, um, feel free to ask them in the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And I will be checking in throughout, answering some questions. Claudia may be answering some questions as well. And then I'll check back in. So again, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box. If we can't get to them right away, we'll do our best to get to them later on in the webinar. So here you go, Claudia. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am thrilled to be here today with all of you to share with you some information about Teen Law School and the work we've been doing with uh, court-ordered kids and non-court-ordered kids around the state of Arizona for the past several years. I'm also happy to share with you information that can be helpful to parents in opening conversations about legal issues, legal challenges facing them in their daily lives and to give you as parents some information that might help you shore up protections around your child um, in this very dangerous environment that our kids are growing up in. I need to start off with a disclaimer right at the top to let you know that I'm not an attorney. 
So everything I say um, today shouldn't be considered legal advice at all, but just facts and information about Arizona law. I want to share with you um, some of the origins of teen law school. It can happen to anyone. Um, good kids will make bad choices uh, and sometimes be held accountable for them in ways that can affect their futures dramatically. Um, this happened in my own family about seven years ago when one of my fabulous teenagers on his way to really gr terif terrific achievements um, made a foolish but very typical teenage mistake that brought police and detectives to our front door. Now our situation worked out very well but that isn't always the case for, um, for, for families in Arizona and as you'll see in just a moment with some statistics. But the experience for me, which was, and for our family, which was so um, shocking emotionally and psychologically, it's very costly financially as well, brought me to a realization that I had not yet, I had not had before. And that was that all of us, adults and children alike, are woefully unaware of the legal environments in which we live. And that ignorance of the law, which can never be considered a defense in the court, in, the, in a court of law, um, is can be very, very dangerous. What we don't know about the law can hurt us. And so, at the time, I began to research um, juvenile justice issues, and I learned that that kids all over the country find themselves in in very serious legal predicaments that they probably never would have found themselves in had they known more about the potential consequences of their actions um, before they took them. So as fate would have it, I met a young uh, juvenile prosecutor, retired, uh, who sat at my kitchen table for months. And the two of us worked out little workshops, little talks um, to share with kids and with parents what they ought to know about the law. And that was several years ago, and today we have um, a variety of curricula that we're delivering around the state. Um, the first is Your Teens in the Law, a shortened version of which you'll be having the, this, this afternoon, what every parent should know now. We also do a four-hour workshop in the general population um, about Arizona law for kids. And then finally we do a Turn It Around program, which is a diversion program. Several years ago, um, well, actually right after we began delivering our first seminar, some folks in state government learned about what we were doing and thought it might have real merit as a diversion program for kids who've had a little brush with the law. And so we were very fortunate to, um, to be supported by uh, a grant from the governor's office through which we began to deliver diversion programming for kids, uh, juvenile offenders in Mojave County in the three cities of Mojave County. Soon that expanded to Yuma County, and then we were invited to become a contracted vendor of the Supreme Court. So today we deliver programming to uh, kids on diversion status, first and second time juvenile offenders, as well as kids on standard probation status, kids who've had a little bit more experience with the system and really have the most to gain by learning how subsequent infractions can cause them even more serious damage. Then uh, just last year, we, under the advice of, gosh, kids and parents and, and folks in government who said, please help develop something for schools, we began to reshape our four and a half hour curriculum into a school-based curriculum. So we piloted this in Kingman, Arizona last August. We brought the uh, entire teen law school curriculum to every ninth grader in Kingman High School over a period of eight consecutive days. Um, so they learned everything they needed to know about Arizona law, plus um, peer pressure resistance skills building. And that's really, those are the two missions of teen law school, to teach kids what they need to know about the law that governs the activities of their daily lives, plus giving them tools and skills that will help them resist risky behaviors or avoid them altogether. Now, why does teen law school work? We think teen law school works for this reason. It's focused around a very rich, deep emotional issue that kids know better than anyone, and that's freedom. Kids are beginning to experience freedom in the most delicious portions, greater and greater portions as they grow older. And if framed in the proper perspective, 
they get their what it means to lose freedom. We have a mantra in teen law school, and it's this. When you break the law, you put your freedom at risk. It's something kids um, will be dreaming about for days after they leave teen law school. But we, we, we create a very emotional relationship between the idea of, of personal freedom and the consequences of losing that personal freedom. It's much like the way it works at home, in homes where, where um, consequences result in the withdrawal of freedoms or, or privileges or technology. Um, we help, help kids understand that freedom is the currency of law. This is just as true for us as adults. Um, we're free to move about our lives very free, very freely uh, without consequences, as long as we behave and follow the, the laws. But once we break a law, we, by our own behavior, invite um, police into our lives and potentially put our freedom at risk. So we think kids ought to know um, how much freedom they're willing to need to be willing to risk to engage in certain risky behaviors. I apologize in advance for a little mess on this next slide. I had an editing issue this morning, but I want to let you know that for, pair, for teens, our, our workshops focus on what we call the six Ds, which we're going to go into detail in a minute. That's the leading legal dangers facing teens today, and then the peer pressure skills building uh, work that we do. For parents, we talk about the seven Cs, and that's what we're going to talk about now, the seven challenges of raising teens today in, in an environment that has such can have such serious legal implications. So let's focus on the six Ds. We, can, we probably all know what the first several are. Drinking, of course, driving, drugs. The kids all get this. Then they start having a little difficulty with the following. Dating, that's always a surprise to kids. But here we're talking about sex and relationships and dating relationships, which, which can be terribly problematic for kids. Digital drama, which every child and parent understands. And then finally, the largest category of all youthful offenses, we call it dumb stuff. We call it dumb stuff because this is the category of, of offenses that occur in dumb moments. When kids aren't thinking for themselves, when they're just following along with the crowd, or when they're so amped up that they're just, they've stopped thinking altogether. Most of the kids, even the juvenile offenders who come into our classrooms, are there for having committed some version of dumb stuff. Um, and we're going to get into that in just one second. But let's start right off with number one challenge for parents. First challenge of raising teens in our environment is this simple statement. The teenage brain is all gas and no brakes. I'm sure we all know what this, uh, we all see it operating in our lives. We, we know as parents and as educators that this is true. And thanks to medical science, we now know why it's true. I'm sure most of you are familiar with adolescent brain development and its, uh, and its uh, implications on behavior. We share this with kids as well as teens. Uh, but basically what, what it has to offer us as, as parents is, that, is to know that the prefrontal cortex is underdeveloped and will be underdeveloped for many years, probably 25 to 27 years old. What happens in that, fr in that frontal part of the brain is the critical thinking, the, the governor, the get the brake pedal the, the one it's the part of the brain that collects all of the information from the rest of the brain and says nah, I don't think that's a good idea weighing all the considerations or yeah weighing all the considerations I think that's a reasonable risk kids don't have that ability in the same measure that we do. and so left to themselves kids under the age of 25 or 27 are going to engage in riskier behavior than we might want them to the reason we teach it to kids is because we help. We think it helps relieve some of the accumulated shame that can develop in kids who hear from the adults in their lives over and over again, what were you thinking, you've made this mistake before, why weren't you thinking, and so on. Uh, we also teach it to them for another reason, and that is the, the physiological effect of this imbalance between the emotional development of the brain, which has been fired up for a long time, and the lack of critical skill, is that kids will experience a visceral emotional feeling. We've all had it. We, we still do, but we experienced it more as kids. That amped up, fueled up, you can't touch me, catch me if you can kind of feeling. That we want kids to understand is not permission. 
it doesn't mean, wow, if it feels so good, it must be good. It means that um, that over flooded feeling is a warning signal. It lets you, it, it's your sign that you're standing at a precipice where you could make a very risky choice that could end up in serious trouble for you. So we want to sort of reprogram. And that's something that you can do as a parent at home is help kids understand um, and borrow your prefrontal cortex to help them plan and decision make. The second challenge I want to share with you is this. Arizona has a particularly strict criminal code. We're, we are a conservative state. Our lawmakers have decided to build a very, um, a very clear and very forceful criminal code, which results in um, adults and kids being sometimes punished at a higher level for the same kind of that would occur in another state. So in another state, we might be able to possess a small amount of marijuana, and it's either legal decriminalized or, or very minor in terms of consequence, not so in Arizona. The answer to that first question, the possession of a, of a personal use of marijuana in Arizona is not a misdemeanor charge, it's a felony charge. All drug possession uh, char events in Arizona start out as felonies. And in the case of marijuana, the felony uh, possession charge is usually accompanied by a felony uh, drug paraphernalia charge. So it starts off as two felonies in our great state. The third challenge I'd like to share with you is this. Juvenile records in Arizona are not kept secret. And by this I don't mean dependency records. I don't mean separation from family or, or domestic issues. I'm talking about criminal uh, records, if you will, behavior records. Uh, this comes as a, a surprise to most kids and most adults because in most other states juveniles are protected their records can disappear at the age of 18. And an 18-year-old in many states is free to move on throughout their life without worrying about their juvenile record being available. In Arizona, um, those records will remain available for police and prosecutors to see for the rest of the person's life. You can, however, petition the court to um, to seal the record at 18. It doesn't happen automatically. But there are lots of attachments to that, lots of provisions and lots of caveats. Nonetheless, uh, in our wired world where anything can appear on the internet, it's very difficult to undo some of the public exposure that juvenile records can have in our state. So when you combine those three, those three facts, that juveniles are particular, adolescents are particularly vulnerable to risky behaviors, that, um, that juveniles records are not kept secret and that we have a very strict uh, punitive system in our state, it's very important for all of us to understand how behavior can forecast the future. Here's just a quick little survey of Arizona teen arrests by age. This comes from the Supreme Court. The most recent data is from um, tw 2012, but you can see that from the age of 12 up to 17, arrests bump up significantly. So once kids enter high school, very, very dangerous area. Let's just quickly talk about some dumb stuff. I want to focus on that middle category, status offenses, because these are the ones that kids get into early trouble with. They are all age-related. These are offenses that wouldn't be offenses if adults committed them. Uh, we're going to talk about curfew specifically a tiny bit about truancy, but I just want to bring your attention to that last word, incorrigibility. Um, we're always, uh, always let kids know what that means and, and essentially it means that uh, unless emancipated or 18 years old, juveniles are obligated to obey the, the reasonable, uh, the reasonable, uh, I, um, <laughs> I've lost my word, uh, the reasonable expectations of their legal uh, guardians, which it means parents, guardians, and then of course at school, uh, school officials and teachers. Can, so does that mean that if your child repeatedly doesn't make their bed or, or gets into arguments and won't listen to you, you can call the police? Well, and legally, they're, yes. Um, it, we don't suggest that. And unfortunately, we do see a lot of kids in our classes whose parents do revert to, to uh, parenting by police. And that's unfortunate because it leaves kids with a record. And uh, that's something we're, we're always happy to share with both parents and kids. Misdemeanors, while they might be minor, they, they still matter. These aren't the, the, the um, offenses that will potentially stain a child's future. 
uh, for a very, very long time, but they can be quite serious. Um, a class three misdemeanor in a, in, that would relate to a child is asking someone to purchase or give them alcohol. A class two misdemeanor, giving someone an STD would be a class two misdemeanor. And a class one misdemeanor, one example of that is shoplifting, which, by the way, happens to be the number one offense that children in Arizona are arrested for year after year, shoplifting. Uh, the status offenses are, um, are the ones we want to be most careful about. Let's talk about curfew a little bit. Now, curfew, curfews are set by cities and towns. So what I'm showing you here is just for most cities in Maricopa. Uh, if, you, if you don't live in Maricopa County, please find out about the curfews in your town by either calling your police department or looking on your, uh, your town's website. Every town has its own exceptions, and every town has its own way of dealing with, uh, with curfew. Um, in most cities in Maricopa County, thankfully, the, the, the curfews are standardized. The reason that curfews are so important for you to stress with your kids are, are three. The first two you see here, because what happens at night is not usually healthy or safe for kids, so it's to protect our kids from others. Also to protect others from our kids. But the real reason that kids need to mind curfew is this. If kids are out after hours and a police officer thinks they look too young to be there, they can be stopped and the police officer can ask for proof of age. Well, any time young people are face to face with police officers can be a very, very difficult situation. And so to protect kids from, um, from that, which can lead to, I mean, what if something else is going on? There's cigarettes involved, there's alcohol there, there might be drugs there. Any number of things which could be far, far more serious than a curfew violation can occur in, in the context of a curfew violation. So my recommendation to, um, to all of you is to help, a, help your children find an alternative to, um, to being out after hours. This is the other piece of curfew information that, appeals, that applies to parents only, and that is that every, uh, every municipality has some version of this language attached to their, cur to their curfew ordinances. And that is that parents are responsible for ensuring that their children um, observe curfew. As you can see, the penalty can be severe for chronic, um, for chronic uh, misuse of, of this curfew violation. So let's move on quickly to truancy. It's an issue in Arizona, unfortunately. Um, we were the first state to send parents to jail for not allowing, for, for allowing their children to miss too much curfew, or too much school. But here's another piece. Curfew violations turned out were that in 78% of cases of all inmates in California prison, truancy was the very first offense on that inmate's record. Falling behind in school can be one of the greatest predictors of future criminal behavior. So um, we stress a lot with children that staying in school um, is their best uh, opportunity for opportunity in the future. Challenge number four is this. Kids, parents can be held responsible for their children's behavior. Um, judges can, can award up to $10,000 in damages for a child's criminal or negligent behavior without even really uh, without much due process. If the judge thinks that your parents can, or can afford more and there are more serious damages, those can be applied to the parent as well. So uh, we, we all have a stake. The state expects parents to parent and will hold parents accountable um, in every case. Here's the fifth. Arizona punishes drug, sex, and alcohol violations extremely seriously. These are the, th the three areas that um, that our rules, our, our regulations, our penalties, our sentence structures can be higher, much higher than in other states and uh, can apply to juveniles as well. So here's a little bit about alcohol I just want to share with you. Um, kids who receive, who are caught drinking alcohol will generally in most cities be given a ticket. It doesn't necessarily rise to the level of superior court, um, but the consequences um, can be costly. There can be uh, community service fees and fines for the court, a record of it, of course, and, um, and those implications. Social hosting, this is for you parents. You must check with your cities. Some cities have very, very strict host social hosting ordinances. Um, others don't have any. But the Arizona law that, that, that uh, applies is that if you have two or more 
unrelated minors in your home and you knew or should have known that alcohol would be consumed, you can be held liable, um, contributing to the delinquency of a minor and other uh, much more serious, including civil consequences, can arise from that. I'm sure all of you know, I hope all of you know, that we have some of the toughest DUI laws in the nation in Arizona. Um, adults and, and, and kids alike, uh, we, the police call it baby DUIs, what kids are involved in. Um, there can be, there will be mandatory jail time for adults for sure on that. Um, probation can last a very long time, ignition interlock. And here's another res uh, reference back to the, to the quiz at the beginning. The record of a DUI never goes away. That will stay on, on your record as an adult or on a juvenile's record forever. We also have something in Arizona I hope you're aware of it called impaired to the slightest degree. The legal limit for an adult with alcohol in their system as a driver is 0.08, but it really doesn't matter if the if a police officer feels that you are impaired uh, to the slightest degree, you can be awarded a DUI. Juveniles can be tried as adults for DUI. Generally, generally not unless there's a serious uh, injury or death, but they they can be um, tremendous. Drug driving, I hope you all are aware, we're only one of seven states in the nation that have this um, that have this law that says that any detectable amount of an illicit drug or its metabolite in your system can result in a DUI. Um, this is this is most people don't know this. Um, if if that little yellow prescription bottle that the doctor gave you has has a yellow tab on it, in, instructing you not to drive, don't because there are laws behind. Um, behind that warning. Even prescription drugs that have been taken without a prescription in your name or out of its therapeutic level can result in DUIs. Arizona classes, classifies drugs in only two ways, dangerous drugs or narcotic drugs. You'll see in those lists many that are quite familiar. In the dangerous drug down in the third, third uh, and fourth lines, clonazepam down to diazepam. We know those under their, their uh, marketing names, Ativan, Valium, Xanax, et cetera. Those tend to be the most commonly abused drugs in drug-related DUIs. But again, they can, be, they can cross over into the illicit range if you don't have a prescription for it in your name or you've taken too much of it. Challenge number six for, for parents is this. The age of consent in Arizona is 18. Uh, we are only one of 11 states that, that holds the age of consent at 18. Uh, the majority of states uh, hold it at 16 years old, meaning that 16-year-olds in those states are legally able to give consent to have sexual conduct with others in our state not. This is not understood by, by uh, kids and not understood by most parents. In fact, parents who enable relationships between um, sexual relationships between kids under the age of 18 can be held liable. It has happened in, in, in not too distant past. Um, there are complicated defenses to this, to this charge. It's really important that kids understand what these defenses are. The first one is legal marriage, which doesn't apply to them. The second is mistaken identity, which can apply. Um, a person 17 years old could easily be duped into thinking that um, a, a potential partner is 14 years old. 14 year olds can look, girls particularly, can look much more mature um, than, than their age. And so the, un, knowing that defense and knowing how to protect against that defense is super important. The biggest defense, uh, remember it doesn't change the law, all sexual contact with kids under the age of 17 is illegal, but the biggest one that they might find um, some safe haven in is the age difference defense. And parents, this is something you need to understand as well. A relationship, a, a sexual physical relationship between uh, kids who are at least 15 and kids who are uh, 18 or 19 if they're in high school, but let's, yeah, if they're in high school, it's complicated. Can't, there can be no more than a 24 month age difference between the two. And 24 months isn't two years. It's, they mean 24 months to the day. So it's important that both parents and kids know how to calculate this, and we make sure that kids do when they're in teen law school. Um, I'm sorry that I don't know how I did that, but somehow I went back to the beginning. So let's 
catch back up here. All right, these are the Romeo and Juliet rules that we make sure everybody understands. Number seven challenge is that screen age crimes are on the rise. And here we're talking about, we're talking about um, what we call digital drama. Um, the digital drama that, that occurs in kids' lives is resulting in kids being arrested. We see a lot of kids getting into trouble under a couple of, uh, a couple of statutes. The first one is, is a threatening and harassing stat statute that, um, that protect, it, it was written to protect all of us from cold callers who call at, at dinner time to, to sell us something. But the statute is now being used to keep kids from robo-texting each other, from, from endlessly interrupting their, their peace uh, and, and their, their quiet time. Um, it, it's very much like bullying, and thank goodness we have, this, uh, we have this important statute right here. You cannot use a phone or a computer to terrify, threaten, intimidate, or harass a person. And we're seeing a lot of kids getting arrested for this. There's also a sexting law in Arizona that's relatively new uh, that does protect, um, it, it, well, it, it keeps kids from being sent to jail on, or prison on child pornography charges. It's good that we have the sexting law. It still makes sexting illegal. Uh, the law simply says if one juvenile sends a, one picture or a picture to another juvenile boyfriend-girlfriend situation, it's a petty offense. It's still $300 a photo. But it doesn't rise to the level of, of a criminal offense unless that photograph is sent to more than one person, meaning the whole school or posted on Facebook, something like that. Um, the fine for that can be significant, up to $750 or four months in jail in per photo. But there are also protections. When you talk to your kids about sexting, you talk to them about the long-term damages that can arise from these images going online, they stay online, can be used by predators, they can be used to prevent uh, uh, jobs in the future. But there are protections. If they were to receive a, an image, they simply can delete it. Your phone, these phones we tell kids, are evidence factories. And they know, they know when a photograph, photograph came in, when it went out, and who it went to. So um, evidence factory is important for kids to understand. So these are some of the topics that we talk about in our class, in our, the legal portion of our class. Um, these are some of the responses that uh, we have gotten from both kids and parents alike. Um, our, our kids live with the fear of, of complication and implication every day. The peer pressure that they experience is, is relentless and it hurts. We know from our work with kids on peer pressure that, that they feel isolated emotionally, they're afraid, um, and, and they have reason to be. So um, speaking about it, helping kids develop some strategies around it is very powerful um, for them, gives them some tools with which they can navigate this, um, this very frightening experience. I just want to finish by sharing with you before I open for questions that, um, that you know, the research shows that kids at this age, of course, they become much more influenced by those, uh, their peers, but you as parents will always be, we as parents will always be the most influential people in our, in our children's lives. And so we encourage, uh, we encourage parents to be as active as possible um, in, in their their uh, sense of self-security, their sense of protection from those influences around them. Um, Teen Law School is, is working with kids and parents around the state to, um, to bring these issues to the fore so that we all know, um, we all know the, more about the legal environments we live in. So let me look and see um, about some questions here. Oh, someone would like to teach it at their school. Absolutely, I'm happy to remind you that we do have a program for schools. And um, someone asked about kids being charged with sex offenses. It does happen, I think, I can't give you the exact number, but there are facilities uh, throughout the state, particularly in Maricopa County, that have hundreds of children in them who have been removed from their families uh, in therapeutic treatment. So thank you so much. Justin, I see you've come back. Yep, I'm just here to help fill some questions, and real okay. quick, while you are answering those questions, I want people to, if you guys are just listening and not checking out the screen, look at the screen. We have a couple um, survey questions just about today's webinar. As we continue, um, we'll keep answering some questions. We'll stay on here, Claudia and I, until you guys are done asking questions.
if you could answer those survey questions, that would be great. And one thing that somebody did ask that I want to know, um, somebody asked if the presentation or if this will be available after the fact. Actually, yes, we make all of our webinars um, available um, within a couple days after the webinar, it'll be posted online, a recording of the webinar. So not just the presentation, but the whole interaction. So people asking questions, answering questions, so you get the full benefit of the webinar. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Claudia. Um, so if you want to continue answering some of those questions um, that people have. Sure. Let me, um, let me uh, answer this one. Someone asked about uh, teaching. Will the webinar be available? Yes. And teaching at schools. Um, teen Law School, as I mentioned, does have a curriculum for schools, but we're also now considering doing teacher trainings. And so uh, we're working on that this summer. We uh, would love to be able to, to train some teachers to, um, we've heard, had a lot of uh, interest from civics teachers, health and PE teachers who would like to, um, to share some of this, this uh, information. So please just feel free to email us at, uh, at info at teenlawschool.com and we'd be happy to share with you the progress we're making in your locality. At the moment, we're, I'm sorry. Sorry. If um, anybody does, like, if you didn't aren't able to jot down the contact info, all attendees of the webinar will be emailed um, my contact info, Claudia's contact info, and the link to the webinar. So don't feel like you need to scramble for a pen and paper right now. We'll get that all sent out to you guys. I have one question that I do want to answer about two 16-year-olds having sex. The question is, is that legal? Uh, the answer would be no. Remember, all sexual contact by anyone under the age of 17, unless they're married, is illegal in our state. Um, the defense of, of, of the age difference defense, the close in age defense, would apply in this case, but that means only that the prosecutor would have to think very long and hard about whether um, there were where there were characteristics of the relationship that would warrant a prosecution. In other words, if it wasn't entirely consensual, if um, you know the parents were extremely angry, if there was a pregnancy, an STD, some sort of intimidation, or 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 some characteristic that that would cause them to see it as other than um, an entirely uh, consensual relationship. All right, let's questions out there. We we'll, we're happy to answer any more questions about this or. For more information, because I'm sure, as you guys saw, Claudia covered a ton of info in a short amount of time, and thank you so much for getting through all that. Um, and that's really the point of these lunchtime webinars, is to bring you a little snippet of um, different topics that you can then pursue finding more information about through our website, through going to teenlawschool.com or drugfreeeasykids.org, um, finding out more about the programs that both of our organizations have to offer and the resources that are available online um, because we know you're busy and you don't have time to sit down and watch a two-hour webinar all the time. So we just want to bring you those little snippets. Um, is there any, are there any more questions here? Oh, well, thank you very much, Leslie, for your compliment. Yes, thank you, Leslie. <laughs> we have any other questions before we wrap things up here? We're more than happy to answer those. And if you have any questions that you forget to ask us, you're more than welcome to email us those questions. Um, when you get the follow-up email, feel free to reply to me and let me know what those questions are, and I will get you in contact with Claudia. Or you'll have her contact info as well if it's a question um, that, that she'd be better at answering. Thank you all very much for joining. It was a pleasure being with you. Thank you, Justin. All right, and thank you again, Claudia, and thank you to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to join us today. I really look forward to um, seeing you guys at our upcoming webinars. Our next webinar, we're going to be talking about e-cigarettes. I know there's a lot going on with e-cigarettes. You see it in the news. You see them on the, uh, at, at the stores. You're seeing kids use them. You hear all these different stories. We're going to get down to the bottom of this um, and give you a little bit more info about e-cigarettes. In the follow-up email to this webinar, I'll make sure to include a link for you to register for that as well. Um, as always, drugfreeeasykids.org slash webinars will have a full list of our upcoming webinars as well as the archived recordings of the webinars that we've already done. So thank you, everybody, and we can't wait to see you again. Thank you, Claudia. Enjoy Oregon, and we can't thank wait you. to see you up here in Arizona. Bye-bye. All right, bye, everybody.